the USS Forrestal, parked right off of Brownsville. And it will be dismantled over the next several months and sold for scrap. You know, as this behemoth warship was making its way to South Texas, a lot of people were saying, wow, wouldn't it be nice if we could convert this ship into a museum, much like they have up in Corpus Christi? You know, the USS Lanx Lexington? That, that's an awesome museum. i got to tell you, I love it. I, when, when Noah goes, I, I love seeing his face light up, seeing all the planes and everything, and it just kind of crawl through all the different spaces inside the ship. But how much would it cost to convert the USS Forrestal into something like the Lexington? You know, some of the, someone who would know the price tag on that, Rocco Montesano is the general manager for the USS Lexington Floating Museum up in Corpus Christi. Rocco, it's a pleasure. Thanks for making time for us this morning. How are you doing? Hey, good morning. It's the see my old ship down there. So what's the price tag for the USS Lexington? How much did it cost to convert it into a museum? Well, of course, the conversion is ongoing, so you always have to add new stuff. But the initial cost, we uh, we borrowed. Uh, the city floated the bond for $3 million for us. We raised a $1 million, so $4 million just to get the doors open. Uh, and pretty much it was pretty bare when, when we got there. So uh, that was, you know, 1991 when it started, yeah. and we opened in 92. So multiply that times a bunch, and uh, Forrestal is twice as big as Lexington. <laughs> imagine how much it would cost. Oh, my Lord. So adjusted for inflation dollars, the $4 million from back then, today would probably be around 6 times 2, $12 million just to have access to the ship or $12 million to refurbish and make it look nice and put some planes on it and all that type of stuff. Yeah, and we had a place for it down in Corpus Christi. You'd have to find a place for it, build a dock. So oh, that's another thing. The, the cost is, actually, there was a group, they called me, there was a group looking to put it in Florida, but uh, as they started going through the cost estimates, they gave it up. Well, Rocco, Tim Sullivan here, realizing the cost and the, the expense and all that goes into uh, the conversion here, if it did ultimately work with the Lexington, why couldn't it work with the Forrestal? I mean, if a museum proposal for the Lexington was accepted, why wasn't it for the Forrestal? Well, I would say this, that the process is much more difficult now. The Navy has uh, increased the requirements as they've seen some of these ships uh, run into a little difficulty financially. So, uh, for instance, Lexington, from the time the application was submitted to really the time it opened the doors, about a year and a half. Uh, in comparison, the Midway out in San Diego took over 10 years to get through the process. Mm. You served on the USS Forrestal, you were telling me yesterday. I did. I, I commanded a squadron on, on board Forrestal, made uh, several deployments. I have, uh, I think, over nearly 300 landings on Forrestal. What year? Eight, or what uh, years? From 1986 to 90. That's towards the end of its term of service. Yeah, towards the end of the service, we made an Indian Ocean deployment, actually two Indian Ocean deployments, uh, North Atlantic deployment. It, it was an operating ship, no question. Um, you know, and it has a history of its own. Yes. It, it, and in fact, that's why one group is trying to save it. It was the first true supercarrier built from the ground up as a supercarrier. All the rest of us, like Lexington, were sort of conversions from World War II. So uh, Forrestal was the uh, the first supercarrier built that way. Are you sad to uh, see it go, pal? You know, in a way, yes. But I'd rather, honestly, see it uh, be useful as scrap than for some struggling outfit to try to put it together. Cause so what will become of it? I mean, once the it's dismantled and the, the metal recycled, uh, where does all of that stuff go? What, Where will we see parts of the forest all? Well, there's, sometimes there's groups that try to get together to save something. When the Cabot was, uh, was, was uh, scrapped in Brownsville, the museum in Pensacola, the Naval Aviation Museum, took the island structure. We actually have two propellers off the, uh, off the Cabot. So Cool. Um, sometimes parts are preserved. I'm not sure. I know there's a group uh, headed down to Brownsville, if they're not there already, uh -huh. from uh, some ship's company that may try to preserve something. Certainly things like the ship's bell. Yeah. Oh. Uh, might you land with some of that uh, memorabilia history? Might that show up on the Lexington? It's possible. Okay. Periodically we'll get contacted by groups that say, hey, we just got this, and you know, can we display it at your place? And 
if it's relevant, we'll, we take a look at it. You started the interview by saying that the refurbishment and the upkeep, it continues all the time at the USS Lexington. So so day to day, what's it like? I, I know that to have a ship like that still in the water, uh, that would require a lot of maintenance for you, just for the, the fact that you're trying to fight off rust, I would imagine. Huge amount. Uh, you know, we're on a very corrosive environment down in, in Corpus Christi, I guess up in Corpus Christi from where you are. But mm-hmm. but um, so we're constantly uh, maintaining the ship. Our budget's uh, a little over $4 million a year, and most of that goes into the ship. This, this, the ironic or sad thing is that a lot of the money that we put in the ship, the public will never see. We have spaces below decks we have to take care of, the hull, oh, yeah. uh, the port side of the ship, which is not really visible to the public. Where does your operation and maintenance money come from? How are you funded? Well, we, uh, we're, fu- we're self-funded, which means we're not getting any federal help, government help. City so help, the right? tourists, uh, we're the ones that are paying through our you admission fee. Awesome. You got it. Are you, are you in the black? Are you okay? We are we are okay. We are one of the few ships that operates in the black Good. with uh, just on the basis of uh, tourism. I'm glad to hear because I want you to be around for a long, long time. My kids are still small, and and I'd love to go back as often as possible to Corpus Christi and take it all in. So uh, a little plug for you before I let you go. Uh, operation you. hours. Uh, when are you open? Monday through Saturday or Sunday? What, what you got? We're only closed two days a year, and that's Thanksgiving and Christmas. We're open right now from nine until five. Spring break, that week of spring break, I think it's from the 8th to the 15th, somewhere in there. We'll be open till 6 at night to okay. accommodate the more tourists we get here. But how many folks? How many folks a day come by on the average? Uh, you know, it varies. We'll, we'll have anywhere from a busy day to, from 2,000 to sometimes 120. Wow. It just depends on the season. Nice. And there. in one year, you'll add that up, but what is it in one year that you get? Uh, last year we did a little over two hundred ninety thousand. That's pretty good. Yes, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's a great uh, a great tourism site for the kids because you got the USS Lexington there uh, docked uh, at, at the Corpus Bay, and then right next door is the Texas uh, Aquarium. The, I forget the name of it, but it's uh, the big yeah, beautiful. Texas State Aquarium. Thank right you. There. Beautiful. Yeah, so it's a great size. You, it, it's within walking distance. You can go to the ship, then you go to the oh, aquarium. It's, it's a great escape up in Corpus. Uh, Rocco, keep in touch, uh, and thank you much for giving us a few minutes this morning. Rocco Monsano, he's the general manager of the USS Lexington Floating Museum up in Corpus Christi.